Good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, second day of chess. Uh, we have a session on um, block ciphers, permutations, and uh, password authenticated key exchange protocol. Uh, we start with a um, paper on block cipher based authenticated encryption. How small can we go? By Avik Chakraborty, Tetsui Iwata. Kazuhiko Minematsu and Mridul Nandi, and the talk will be given by Avik. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. So, uh, I am Avik Chakravorty, uh, affiliated with NTT Secure Platform Laboratories, and this work has been uh, jointly done with Professor Tetsu Yata from Nagoya University, Dr. Kazuhiko Minematsu from NEC Corporation, and Dr. Mridul Nandi from Indian Statistical Institute. So, as the name suggests, this talk is based on the design of a block cipher based authenticated encryption. And the question says that how small can we go? So, our main motivation is to design a block cipher based A scheme with the lowest possible state. Okay. So, first I will give some introduction, some prerequisites to understand the talk. So, uh, this is an authenticated encryption design. So, the first question comes what is authenticated encryption? Uh, suppose uh, Alice and Bob are transmitting some messages, so it's natural that they don't want any third party to, ha to have access to the message. So they can do it by, uh, so this is called privacy preservation of the message, and they can do it by some symmetric key encryption scheme. And we also need that the data should be authentic. That means uh, Bob should know that the message has actually come from Alice. So we, we also need authenticity of data. And we can do this by uh, using some Mac. But there are some applications where we need both privacy and authenticity. So how can we do that? So we can use an uh, authenticated encryption scheme, which is actually uh, some efficient integration of uh, encryption and a Mac. Okay? So formally, uh, an authenticated encryption scheme is a tuple of two algorithms, encryption and decryption, or E and D. So it takes a secret key from the key space, a message, uh, to public variables, nonce and associated data, and it generates a tagged ciphertext. So here, C is actually a tagged ciphertext, a tuple of ciphertext and a tag. And for decryption, it takes the key, it takes the tagged ciphertext, it takes the same two public parameters, nonce and associated data, and it either generates the message if the tag is valid, otherwise it just rejects the message. So. So now I'm coming to the public variables like nonce and associated data. So nonce can be considered as some arbitrary number which is used only once for, the, for each encryption. 
and uh, like one one example can be counter or some other random uh, value which which are not repeated. Okay. And the second uh, public variable is associated data, which is like uh, which which resides in the header of the message. So it is actually some information about the message transmission, like the IP address of the receiver or the IP address of the next router, like that. So now note that. Uh, this nonce and associated data are used during the protocol. So the protocol can see this, but they don't have a secret key. So that's why we cannot encrypt the nonce and associated data. Otherwise, they have to decrypt it and get the uh, message uh, information for the message transmission. Okay? But definitely, we need to authenticate this nonce and associated data. The protocol should authenticate. What is the IP address? What is the counter? So we need privacy for only message. But we need authenticity for both non-associated data and message. So these are real life examples. Mm. Suppose a doctor wishes to send some medical information about Alice. So it may be quite natural that Alice doesn't want to disclose her disease information. So, in, uh, so for this, we need privacy over Alice's disease information. And uh, we also want integrity because the database should know that the message the information has actually come from the doctor. So we also need authenticity over the information. So uh, one convenient way to uh, impose this privacy and authenticity is to use authenticated encryption. So this is security of authenticated encryption. So for privacy, we just need standard security of in CPA of the output. And uh, for integrity, <coughs> uh, it is slightly different from Mac. Like uh, for Mac, we use int ptxt or integrity of the plain text. The adversary just generates a valid. Adversary's goal is to generate a valid message and ciphertext tag pair, but uh, message and tag pair. But here we we need int ctxt or integrity of the ciphertext. So here adversary's goal is to generate a valid valid tagged ciphertext, nonce and associated data tuple. Okay. And our main goal is to provide both in CPA and in ctxt. So in this work, we have used one equivalent notion of authenticated encryption security called Unify AE security. So where we consider an adversary which runs in time t, it makes Q encryption queries to the encryption oracle, and uh, the number of total uh, blocks, message blo data blocks are sigma. It makes Q F forge, forge queries with sigma F forge blocks. And uh, in the real world, the adversary gets the encryption and decryption oracle both, and in the ideal world, it gets a random oracle corresponding to the encryption oracle, uh, dollar, and a reject oracle. So uh, dollar returns just a random string from the range set of ek, and a reject oracle always returns reject. And uh, this is the standard definition of uh, advantage, which is taken over all the adversary running in q, q, f, sigma, sigma, f, and t parameter. So now I'm coming to the construction of A schemes, how they can be constructed. Uh, they can be constructed in different ways. One is uh, the A can be block cipher based, or stream cipher based, or permutation based like sponge. And there are some, some hybrid construction. There are very few hybrid cons construction. But in this work, we considered a block cipher based authenticated encryption scheme. Now, block cipher based AE can be designed in several ways. One is sequential nonce based AE, or it, it is also called feedback based AE, where the uh, output from the previous round is passed as a feedback to the next round. Uh, another is, uh, so one example, two examples can be clock and silk, and there are many other. Uh, the second one is parallel online AE. Some examples are ELMD, COPA, and COM. And the third one is parallel nonce-based AE, which can be uh, OCB or OTR. And actually, all these schemes are submission to the Caesar competition. Now, our target is to uh, design a sequential nonce-based AE or feedback based AE, because it is, is uh, because it is easy to design and we can get better result from this. So it, it's uh, our intuition says that. So for this, we need to design a efficient feedback function. So now, how what are the possible options for designing feedback function? So actually, the main three variables in the state are the current message block, current ciphertext block, and the previous block cipher output. Okay. So, so we can feedback uh, either of these three. One can be only message feedback, where the message passed as the next feedback. 
The second one can be ciphertext feedback. The current ciphertext block can be passed as the next feedback. The third one can be output feedback. The previous block cipher output can be passed to the next feedback. But in this case, uh, in, in our design, we try to minimize the state. So to minimize state, we have to sacrifice some security. But we have observed that if we use some kind of combined feedback, then we can get standard security bound. Like, uh, so our main uh, aim is to design a small state rate, a, rate one A. I am coming to the terms later. And uh, now in, in, in our feedback, the next block cipher input, that is XI, cannot be computed by exactly one of MICI and YI minus one. We need at least two of them. Okay. The feedback function should be designed in that way. <coughs> so these are, these are the pictures. So here, the, the, the row function is actually the, our feedback function. And this G is uh, specific to our construction. So I'm coming to it later. So in, in our construction, the MI and CI or, or MI and YI minus 1, or CI and YI minus 1, both of them has effect to XI. No, no, not exactly one. <coughs> so uh, I'm coming to the specification of COFB. So, uh, so first, the design of COFB, the, the goal of this design. So actually, we have many goals to construct this uh, authenticated encryption scheme. The first goal is to it should be lightweight, authenticated encryption mode. Uh, it should use low storage. It should have standard security bound. So we, we haven't been able to find exactly birthday bound, but we have uh, observed that we can get almost birthday bound on the block size. So we have security proof in the standard model, and we have smaller hardware area than the existing ones. And the last point is the most important, that our main motivation was to use as, uh, as low as uh, uh, very few operations other than the block cipher circuit. Uh, it, we should be as low as possible. So we have uh, achieved very low number of gates other than the block cipher circuit, very simple operations. So these are the design rationales and challenges. So we use combined feedback. So COFB actually stands for combined feedback. So we use very small number of states. It needs only n bits for, the sto for storing the block cipher state. It needs k bits for storing the block cipher key. And we use some extra technique called masking, some secret masking, which needs only n by 2 bits. Okay. So this masking technique has been adopted from the XCX construction by Philip Rogawe to construct a TBC. But in, in our case, so Philip, uh, so Philip used uh, n bit masking, n bit secret masking. But in our case, we have observed that if, since we are using combined feedback, we can reduce the size of the masking. By two n by two bits, so we can reduce the n by two bit register in our construction, and we have observed that it is sufficient for standard security bound. If we even if you use n by two bit masking, so there are some comparisons between the state size. So COFB uses three n by two plus k bit state, and we have, uh, but it it achieves rate one. So rate rate means the number of data blocks per block cipher call. So higher the rate more efficient will be the construction. <coughs> so the, the construction can uh, process more block, more block data blocks per block cipher call. So we have observed that in case of Jambu, it also achieves 3n by 2 plus k bit state, but it has rate half. So it is slower than COFB. And also COFB uses very few operations other than the block cipher circuit, but Jambu uses uh, more operations. Uh, they, they uses a lot of operations other than the block cipher circuit. So theoretically, even if they have both of them have 1.5n plus k bit state, but still, Jumbo is uh, worse in terms of state's uh, rate and number of operations. And and uh, and COFB definitely outperforms all the other constructions by uh, with respect to the state size and the rate. And some of them even uh, they do not do not have any security proof or they have been attacked. So this is the construction for COFB. So the construction is very simple. The nonce is processed first. And uh, then it is feedback to the next state along with the associated data blocks. Then after, it generates the intermediate variable Y3. And this Y3 is again processed in the message processing phase. And then finally, one extra block cipher call is needed to generate the tag. So here we use one mask mask function, which is actually used for secret masking. 
the delta is the mask value and this mask function updates the delta at each round. <coughs> so delta is initialized by n by 2 bits of the encrypted nonce and uh, the mask function updates it by alpha to the power a into 1 plus alpha to the power b into delta. So this alpha is a primitive element from uh, f2 to the power n by 2. And I'm coming to it later. <coughs> Uh, this row one is the feedback function during the associated data processing phase. We just multiply the uh, block cipher output by a simple matrix G and exhort the current data block, current associated data block. And row is ac uh, ex actually exactly the same as row one, except it releases cipher text block. So the so row has one more output. So row YM is equal to row one YM comma Y plus M. Now. This G is a very simple matrix, but it should, should not be equal to identity matrix because row 1 YM is, e is equal to GY plus M and this Y plus M is equal to I, I Y plus M. Okay? So if G equal to Y, then both of these will be equal and this will become ciphertext feedback. Okay? So, uh, so if G not equal to Y, then we can achieve combined feedback mode and it should have full rank because the previous output has full effect to the next output, next input. And uh, this delta A and delta M, they are actually used for domain separation. This is a standard technique for domain separation. And delta A says that now the associated data processing phase has now ended. Now we can start the message processing phase. And delta M says that now the message processing phase has ended. We can now generate the tag. So the delta A and delta M can be generated in this way. So if, uh, so if B can be either A or M, so if B is the last block, and b is not complete, then we set delta b is equal to 2, otherwise we set delta b is equal to 1. So this is a standard technique. So <coughs> we instantiate COFB AE mode with AES, so we, can, we could use some lightweight block cipher, but in this work our main motivation is to advertise the authenticated encryption mode, not the exact instantiation. So because this mode is very flexible and we can use any block cipher. So that's why we have chosen a standard block cipher here. So where uh, we use AES 128 with state size 128, n equal to 128. So the, we use a simple mask function, uh, uh, which updates the tweak. We use simple linear feedback functions. And the last block has different tweak according to the domain separation technique. So the tweak function is a 64-bit value derived from the encrypted nonce. And it just uh, updates the mask alpha to the power into 1, by 1 plus alpha to the power b. So alpha is a primitive element of f2 to the power 64, and the idea is taken from xcx construction. And this ab, that means uh, this ab can vary from 0 to the 0 to well times 0 to 4. Because 0 to well is actually uh, increments the power up to the, uh, just before the last block, and 0 to 4 works in the last block. So which can be mac minimum 0, maximum delta a plus delta m, that means 4. This is a linear feedback function, so row 1 is just GY plus M, and this G is a very simple matrix, it just shifts one, left sh one block left shift and do some simple operation Y4 plus Y1, and it can be represent by represented by this matrix. It's, it's very simple, it's almost equivalent to identity matrix. So this is a security level for CIBIS, so in our security proof we assume uh, nonce respecting adversary, and we achieve almost birthday bound of 64 bits for privacy and the same for authenticity. Actually, theoretically, we have achieved order of uh, 2 to the power n by 2 by n queries to make to make it secure. Uh, and it is not exactly birthday bound. So for CFBAES, it will be like 2 to the power 64 by 128. Some important features, uh, so it has rate one, which is very efficient. So it just process one block, cipher, one block per block cipher call. It has very low state size of 3n by 2 plus k. Uh, the mode is very flexible, so we can fit any block cipher in this mode. Uh, so if we use lower, uh, some lightweight block cipher, then more lighter than AES, then we will get better results. So it is inverse free. That means uh, during the decryption, we do not make any block cipher inverse call. So we, we just make forward call. It has simple linear feedback function. It is very lightweight and consumes very hard, low hardware area. But it has one limitation. Like uh, most of the A schemes, the encryptions are serial, decryptions are parallel, or the opposite way. But in our case, both the encryption and decryption are completely serial. 
So this is one disadvantage. But any, anyway, we, we are getting very lightweight construction, so, so we don't care much about the speed. So these are, so I'm coming to the hardware implementation results of CYFB. So first is a cycle CPB performance of CYFB AES. Uh, so we, uh, we assume A block associated data and M block message. So here the cycle count will be 12 plus 12 into A plus M plus 11. So the first 12 is for encryption of clones and uh, initialization of delta, the mask. The s and for each ADN message block, we need 12, 12 clock cycle. So 11 for AES and one for updating the tweak and f uh, feedback computation. And the final 11 is for the last uh, tag generation, the last A call. So in our table, we assume that A equal to M. So if it is 16, then we assume 16 block AD and 16 block message. But uh, when we count the CPB, we just uh, we calculate the cycle count for both a AD and M. But when we count the CPB, we just consider only M. We, we don't consider AD. So and uh, this uh, LEN is the length of message in bytes. So that was in A and M are blocks, and uh, LEN is bytes. So LEN is actually 16 into M. Okay. So we have observed that this this actually diverges to 1.50 when the number of blocks uh, increases because this 12 and 11 part are negligible, and for 12 into A M part, so we actually do 12 into A plus M divided by 16 M, okay? And here A equal to M, so it becomes 24 by 16. So that's that means 1.5. So it uh, gradually converges to 1.5. So this is a graphical representation of the CPP calculation. Uh, this is the base architecture for CFB AES. We use three registers, one for the block cipher state, one for the key, and one for delta. And the below there are three uh, modules. One is AES round function, one is row for the feedback computation, and one is tweak for the tweak update function. So it generates, it takes one data AD block or one message block, and it generates the tag and the cipher text after the computation is done. So it has some properties. So it is actually a serial processing of data. We didn't use any pipelining or anything. It's just a round-based implementation of AES, and it just processes the data serially. It has no pipelining. So it processes 128 bits per 12 clock cycle. It uses very low storage registers. It has a minimum hardware area among all the known block cipher-based AE constructions. And uh, this is a finite state machine for CIB AES. The dotted rectangle denotes the FSM for AES. And this is the all over FSM for CIB AES. So these are the hardware implementation results we got in Vertex 6 and Vertex 7 under Xilinx 13.4. We have used VHDL. And uh, finally, we have compared these results with the results in the Athena database maintained by George Mason University. But uh, they have used some specific interface, which is called GMU interface, for, for their implementation. But our, our implementation is not compatible with GMU interface. It's just a basic serial implementation. So we have got uh, these results in Vertex 6 and Vertex 7. And, we, we, uh, and, and uh, we initially, we thought that we wouldn't get uh, much better speed. But uh, at the end, we observed that even if the hardware is low, but still we got some good GBPS in our construction. So these are the benchmarking of CFB AES on Vertex 6. So we have also used, uh, we have also got the result for Vertex 7 and we will include it in the full version, in the fully printed version. So we have observed that uh, CFB AES has got the best hardware area out of all the block cipher based A constructions. So it, it is only outperformed by Acorn and Primate Sanuman, but they are either stream cipher based or sponge based. But among all the BC based construction, CIB is the best in terms of hardware area. And uh, I would also like to note that uh, in case of Jambu Simon, they use Simon as the underlying block cipher, where Simon is much lighter than AES. But still, we have got better hardware area because Jambu Simon is using many, uh, Jambu is using uh, more operations than COFB other than the block cipher circuit. So yeah, this is the result for CFB AES. So finally, I would conclude. So it's a block cipher based A. It is secure up to 2 to the power n by 2 by n queries. 
it uses a low area authenticated encryption scheme and it can be used for it can be very useful for low resource embedded devices so there are some references which i have used in my presentation so thank you any questions nobody then maybe I have a question. So what happens um, if you release unverified plain text? Uh, if, if I release? If you release unverified plain text. So you don't be secure because it is red one. Okay. So it is, it is so. It's no problem. Uh, yeah, so any, okay. any red one block cipher based A construction yeah. is not secure under uh, RUP. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> okay, so um, now we have the much anticipated talk on Gimli. Um, I will read the authors so that Benoit has some time left. Huh? Uh, so it's um, a paper by Dan Bernstein, Stefan Kölbel, Stefan Lux, Pedro Mat Costa Masolino, Florian Mendel, Kashif Nawaz, Tobias Schneider, Peter Schwabe, François Xavier Standard, Yosuke Todo, and Benoit Viguier. Benoit will give the talk. My supervisor for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to, going to I'm going to present Gimli a cross-platform permutation. So first of all, what's a permutation? A permutation is a keyless block cipher. Wait, what? Uh, so if you take, for example, an even even mensure construction, you can see that you have FZ permutation here, and you have XOR of a key in front of, of the back. So we are specifically going to have a look at this small piece of hardware or software. Um, you can also use permutation in the sponge construction here, where you recognize uh, the picture of uh, Ketchak, for example, you, where you have the permutation which is applied here and between every absorption stage or um, between every squeeze stage. So let's have a look at what we have as a permutation nowadays. So we have, for example, AES with a fixed key, um, very fast if you have a hardware support. We have Shasky, which is lightning fast of, uh, on M0, M3, M4. We have uh, Ketchak Hef, which provides a very low masking scheme uh, due to its uh, uh, ski structures. We have Salsa 20 and Tenta 20, which are very fast with uh, vector instruction. Um, so those are really nice, but, um, well, IES is not that fast if you don't have a hardware support. Um, Shasky has a very low security margin and it's kind of difficult to protect against side channel. Um, Ketchak Hef has a huge state if you take the 800 or 1600 version. Um, Salsa 20, Chacha 20 have, um, well, not that great in hardware. Um, also, like the problem of the huge states of Ketchak, for example, is when you want to compute just 56 bit of hash, you still need to work with the thousand bits of the state. So you have like something like uh, 500 bits that you are actually computed without really using them. So the question is, can we have a good permutation that is, well, technically good in all this area, and not too small, not too big? And the question is, well, yes, Gimli. So Gimli is a 384-bit permutation, uh, just the right size, because 384 bits just happen to fit right in the registers for Cortex M3, M4. Um, if you take just half the state, so 1,092 bits, well, you can have that in AVR or Cortex-M0. Also, if you use it as a sponge mode, then you can just absorb 128 bits and have 256, 256 bits of capacity, which gives you like 128 bits of security. So also quite good for that. So it's aimed to be good as cross platform, um, hardware and software. And so it aims to be energy efficient, side channel protected due, due to the SP box construction, easy on microcontrollers such as any kind of platform, compact, vectorized, like we are inspiring ourselves from the Salsa 20, Chacha 20. And given its small states, it's also efficient on short message and still providing a high security level. 
So let's have a look a bit more of what Gimli is. Gimli looks really like a bit Ketchak in the state representation. So we are considering it at a three by four matrix of 32 bits words. So you have 32 bits as a, as a lane here. And we are going to work on it. So you can already see the structure which appears like we have columns and we have rows. And we are going to work non-linearly on columns and linearly on the rows. So let's have a look at the column work. So we first do a rotation by nine and eight on the two upper rows. And then we apply this nine bits. So we have here nine bits as input to a three bit output SP box. And then we just swap the upper and lower layer. And that's enough to provide a decent uh, nonlinear part. Also notice that the rotation here and the shift uh, take care of propagating the difference through the lane. Then, because we are just working on columns, we want to propagate our uh, nonlinearity through the states as a row part. So then we are going to use small swaps and big swaps. So the small swaps here um, are going just to just swap these two values and these two values inside our states. So this will occur at round zero, four, and eight, and so on. And every two other rounds, so round two, six, and so on, we'll swap the two, these two words with these two words. So you can see here that we are working on half a state, and then we are actually propagating through the whole state the, the difference. And well, you could say, wait, this is not cool because you have a, a symmetry axis like the vertical axis here. Um, so which is why we decided to add this uh, number. So this is the golden ratio number on which the two va last values are actually the rounded x. So this value is updated. Uh, every four rounds, and it's, I mean, I don't think we can backdoor this number given that's the same constant that is being used in TEA and so on, so nothing, nothing up in my sleeve. So that's the full code of Gimli, the C code. So we can see the 24 rounds here, then the application of, on the four columns of the SP box, and then the small swap, the, the big swap, and the constant addition. So let's have a look a bit more why Gimli is interesting. So if we unroll the first seven rounds of Gimli, here is what happened. We can see that we are working on a, a half here and a half here. And given that the SP box is actually parallel, we can consider like, hey, we can use vectors. Like, let's say that we have three vectors of four words of 32 bits. That's exactly this SSE instruction. Then you can consider applying them like with a vector like, and just all that part is directly application on the four lanes, that's four columns at the same time, and then that's just a circle. So all the it really fits the vector design. Um, in terms of computation, let's have a look at. For example, AVR or Cortex M0. AVR or Cortex M0 can only fit half the states, but we can still compute it in an in efficient way. So, for example, we compute like this SP box, and then we compute this three times, and then two times on the SP box. So, all that part, we haven't had any load or store. Then we completely store the states and load the other half. And, and once we have computed these three rounds, we just push to the stack the words, the upper words, and we load from the memory these two words. And then we can compute again four rounds. So this gives us like seven rounds of Gimli on the same part with very, very minimal amount of loads of store, which is why Gimli is quite interesting for AVR or Cortex M0. And then you can do the same thing. So at that point, you just store the state, load the state here, and you go back and you do eight rounds and so on. So the implementation in assembly is the following. So we have here the rotation by nine, uh, 24 and 9. And then we have the shifts, the XOR, and so on. We just need two registers. So let me think. 384 bits divided by 12 is equal to 32. So that's just 12 registers. Plus two registers, that's exactly 14 registers. Hey, I can 
just directly put that in my ARM N3 M4. So ARM N3 M4 has a very nice features, which allows you to, at the same time you do an arithmetic or binary operation, you can also do a rotation or a shift at the same time. So let's see how we can optimize this SP box just with ARM and M3. So we are first going to get rid of this rotation. So whenever there is a Y, I'm going to rotate at the same time by nine. And then we are going to get rid of the shifts here. So this shift and this shift and this shift and this shift are going to disappear within the next operation. Up. And then because we are actually directly working on the state and we don't have any loads and so we can directly get rid of the moves by renaming. So here U contains a new value of X and Y contains a new value of Y. So we are going to rename that part here. So now V contains a new value of Y. And because in the SP box we had um, a swap between the upper and lower row, we can just rename well U and Z. And in the total, the U contains our new value of Z, and Z contains our new value of X, and that's just 10 instruction. So 10 instruction by 4 by 24, that's about 900 instruction for the full computation of Gimli. So let's see how fast is it. If we fully enroll uh, Gimli on AVR, we are about here. So that's faster than Salsa 20. Um, if we are in the most compact version, we are like twice slower. Um, the cost of going so fast is, well, that is, that's a thousand byte code, that's a 20,000 byte code. So you might want, not want to use the fastest version. Well, as compared to AES, well, AES is just optimized for 8 bit, 8 bit because um, that's just the string alignments. Sorry, Johan, I can't. <laughs> so let's have a look at Cortex M0. Well, Shasky is like beating us by a very large margin. And then we have ChaCha20 and uh, Gimli. So we are pretty close to ChaCha20. I would say Shasky is our category, like we can't get past that, sorry. Uh, but still, we are pretty close to ChaCha20. So that's still correct. Um, let's have a look at M3, M4. Well. So here is Chasky again, then we have ChaCha20, Gimli, and then we have AES and Kechak400. Um, we are actually faster than Kechak400, that's pretty cool. We are faster than AES128, so that's also really nice. Um, and then that's where the vectorization kicks in. On Cortex A8, we are like twice faster than AES, and that's considering like using AES on multiple blocks, and we are just using one block of Gimli. Or we are twice faster again than Ketchak 800, using, for example, River Kiak, and we are about the same speed as Salsa 20 and Chacha 20. And then we can look at the usual computer, and then we are here, so also faster than Ki Ketchak, Kiak, um, Nox beats us, computing one block at the same time, but then with the parallelism of Gimli, intrinsically, then we get pretty close to Salsa 20, Chacha 20. And if you have hardware support using multiple blocks, uh, well, we can't beat AES. So I would say we're pretty good. I mean, it doesn't look like that, but that's just the cream of the cream. I'm like, I'm not looking at all the other spots which are over, like if I were to talk about Kitchak 400 there, uh, there is no optimized code on the UN 4 Kitchak 400, for example. So, how oh, is it good? Is it for, for example, hardware? So here I'm considering the number of gates or states uh, slice and multiplied by the time it's re it is required to compute the permutation, considering like two cycles to compute the full permutation, and divided by the state because I'm comparing with ASCON. So ASCON has a 3 to 20 bit state. Um, Ketchak 400 has a 400 bit state and we have a 384 bit state, so it's kind of nice to normalize us if we want to be fair. So we can see that um, we are okay ish, I'd say, um, on FPGA and ASCII platforms, like faster, well, better ratio, I'd say, here, a bit worse here, better here. So in hardware, we're also pretty good. 
So what Osecur is Gimli? Well, if you just take one bit, so here we are going to do a small propagation analysis. So this means that we change every XOR and ON operation by a logical OR. So we can see how fast a bit propagate. So here we have like 10 rod avalanche effect, and if we just put that bit to one, and the full state is to zero, let's see how many rounds does it need to take the full case. So two bits, five bits, 20 bits, 57 uh, bits, so that's the full round that we kicks, that kicks in here. We can see that the SP box here is propagated to this round. Two rounds later, we have the swap here, and at eight rounds, then we have the worst case propagation. It's decent. If we look at the differential of the eight rounds, then we have a probability of optimal trail uh, of two to the power of minus 52. Uh, notice that we have two empty columns here. That might sound scary. Wait, no, because that's where actually after eight rounds you have the big swap kicks in, and that's where then the differential are actually going to propagate quite a lot. So if we go to 12 rounds array, then the probability is multiplied by two at least. Well, divided by, uh, so it's around two to the power 100, something like that. So differential propagation of optimal trade of eight rounds, and we have algebraic distinguishers on 11 rounds, so that's kind of, if you express uh, a bit, so the Z0 bit, as a polynomial of all the other bits, you have a degree of 367, and we have uh, 11 round on 30 round, rounds integral distinguishers with 96 active bits and 92 bits. So an integral distinguisher is you take multiple states, you gather them together, and you try to find some properties on it. So Mike Attack. Uh, on August 1st, uh, Mike Hamburg uh, claimed an attack against the 192-bit key, which required uh, to the power 138 work and to the power 129 bits memory. Um, it's more time and hardware than naive brute force attack, uh, even using golden collision technique. And well, what might made the emphasis on during his talk is, well, Gimli is nice, but be a bit wary of how you use it. So if we go back to the first slide, Quickly, chuk, chuk, chuk. that one. You see that Mike's really put the emphasis on absorbing on the column, taking advantage of the low propagation here. So if we actually absorb just on the first row here, taking these two parts as a capacity for a sponge mode, then we are back to be secure. So sure, Mike's attack is kind of legit, like, yeah, but if we just use it correctly, then it's fine. And, um, well, thank you for your attention. Any questions? No questions? Um, I have a question. So you investigated differential trails. Are there plans to also investigate linear trails? Uh, we don't have plans to investigate, well, I would say we don't, not we don't have, but we haven't investigated linear trace now, for now. The problem of Gimli is, just like Kitschak, it doesn't have a strong alignment, it doesn't have a byte structure, so it's a bit harder to investigate trails. Um, well, you wrote the paper, Differential Cryptanalysis of Kitschak, so you know pretty but, well of that. But you did differential, so it's similar, no? Yeah. But there are no plans. Well, I don't know for that now. I mean, Stefan probably can told you, take you more about that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank Benoit again. Okay. So now we go back to block ciphers, if I understand correctly. So this is GIFT. It's an update of present. It's called a small present. Uh, it's a talk by a uh, paper by Subhadeep Banik, Sumit Kumar Pandey, Thomas Perrin, Xiangmeng Sim, 
Yusuke Todo and Yu Sasaki. And the talk will be given by Shang Man. Good morning. So today I'll be talking about GIF, a small present and also a more secure present. So this is a joint work with Subati, Sumi, Toma, Yu and Yosuke. So first I'll give an introduction followed by the specification of GIF and the design rationale and security and performance and finally the conclusion. So first, before I begin with GIF, we, can, we have to go back to 10 years ago to look at present. So 10 years ago, present was presented at CHESS 2007. It's a 31 round SPN block cipher which is, has a very simple and nice design. It just has a layer of S boxes and a bit permutation. So there's no mixed column, so it's extremely lightweight. And in 2012, it's selected as an ISO standard. So it's resistant against differential cryptanalysis mainly because its S box has a property known as the differential branching number three. So to give an example, for instance, if you have some differential four, so technically it's Hemingway one, and if there's a transition to another Hemingway one, then this will be a maximum branching number of two. So for branching number three, for any input, non-zero input difference and output difference, there's at least three, uh, the Hemingway is at least three. So the present make use of this property that after one S box, there's at least two active bits, so this will propagate to another two, S, two different Xboxes, so there will be more active Xboxes. However, for branching number three Xbox, it's generally quite costly. So just a quick comparison with present Xbox and Skinny, it's like, yeah, like 8 GE. And this difference will multiply by 16 times when you consider a round-based implementation because you have 16 Xboxes in parallel. And also, the branching number three property doesn't apply to the linear case, so it's slightly weaker in the linear cryptanalysis. And over the years, there has been a lot of research on cryptanalysis, linear cryptanalysis on present. So now, it, 10 years later, in 2017, we are presenting a new lightweight block cipher, improvement over present, so we call it a GIF. So by carefully designing the bit permutation and the in conjunction with the Xbox property, we can remove the branching number three constraint. So this allows us to choose a smaller and lighter Xbox. And also we can have a better resistance against linear capital analysis. And because of that, we can actually reduce the number of rounds to, be, to have a higher throughput. And we have a simpler and faster key schedule. So now I'll describe GIF. So there are two versions of GIF. One is 64-bit GIF and a 128-bit GIF. And both of them use 128-bit key size. So this is how one round of GIF looks like. So you have the Xbox layer, the bit permutation, and the add round keys. And uh, we denote the rightmost one as the least significant bit, B0. And for every four bits, we group them together as bit J. So for example, B1, B, uh, B1, B5, B9, all these, we group them as bit 1. So for the subcells, it's quite simple. You just simply implement 16 S-boxes in parallel. And this is the truth table for give S-box. So I will talk about the property of the S-box later in the design rationale. And for the bit permutation, like present, it's just rewiring. So in terms of hardware, there's no additional cost. There's no uh, XOR gates here. And there's one property is that all the bit I will map to the bit I. So like all the bit zero will go to bit zero, all the bit one goes to bit one. And for the add round key, similar to skinny, we only update half of the state with the key. So for everyone, we are at a 32-bit round key. And for this 32-bit, we split into two 16-bit words. 
and for u, we will XOR it to order bit 1, and for v, we will XOR to order bit 0. So here you can see the red XORs are the at round key position. And besides the at round key, we also add some constant. So at the most significant bit here, we add a single one bit, and we use a six bit counter and XOR it to the bit tree of the first six nibbles over here. And this is basically one round of GIF, and we just repeat it 28 times for GIF 64. And for the key schedule, it's quite simple. There's no S box or XOR in the key schedule, just permutation. So we split the 128 bit key into eight 16 bit words, and we extract the rightmost 32 bits as the first round key. And after that, we will update the key state by doing an entire state rotation of 32 bits. And within the two 16 bit words, we do another 2 and 12 bit rotation. And for the round constant, we use the same round constant used in Skinny, which only use a one XNOR gate, so it's very light. And we have initialized it to all zeros and update it first before using it as a round constant. So here is the table for the constant. OK, so now we'll go to the design rationale. So to talk about the design of GIF, we have to first understand present. So first, we need to understand why branching number two S boxes doesn't work with present design. OK, so. Uh, to look at the present bit permutation, it is known that for the bit present bit permutation, it can be partitioned into four independent 16-bit permutation. If you can follow the color, the first 16-bit will map to S0, S4, S8, and S12. So if we just write them out, we will call the output bits from the previous S boxes as the quotient group. So quotient group. 0 has S0, 1, 2, 3, will map to the remainder group S box S0, 4, 8, 12, and so on. And for these four group mapping, they have the same permutation. Okay, so the 16 bit permutation can be represented using this table. So, how do we look at this? So, for the first co coefficient, I'm sorry, the first coordinate, you represent the output bit position from the previous S box, and the next coefficient coordinate represent the input bit position. So for instance, for B1 is the bit one of S0. So for bit one of S0, it goes to bit zero or S4. So bit one will goes to B0 or S4. So one will map to 16. So that's how we can read this. And besides this, we also need to look at the DDT, the distri differential distribution table. So, but we just focus on the transition that has Hemingway 1. So we just look at 1, 2, 4, and 8. So this is an example of a 1 to 1 bit DDT. So it is obvious that if a S box has branching number 3, then this table will be all zeros because there's no 1. Hemingway 1 to Hemingway 1 transition. So let's say we put this S box into the present and we'll see what will happen. So suppose we have some input difference and with a Hemingway 1 output. So now from this permutation, bit 0 goes to bit 0. So it goes to bit 0 S0. And because there's a transition from bit 0 to bit 1, you will have this single active bit here, which again will goes to another bit zero, and then this property repeats again. And this will go on for five rounds until here, where it enters at bit one. And because for bit one, there's no Hemingway one transition, then the propagation will begin. So as you can see, compared to original present we have, which can prove to have at least 10 active X boxes for five rounds. If you just use a branching number two S box, you can only achieve five active S boxes in five rounds. So in conclusion, the present bit permutation is not suitable for
branching number two S box. So how do we design our GIF permutation? So we we'll give a notation called the bad output must goes to good input or bogey for short. So for instance, for bit zero and bit three, we will classify them as the bad input because if the active bits is in zero or three, you can potentially go to bit one or bit two. So the red one are the B1, B2 are the bad output, and the rest are the good inputs. So the observation is that if there is a single active bit transition occurs, means some S-box is active with Hemming weight one from the input and the output, which will occur at some point for branching number two S-boxes. Then in that case, the active bit output must be in the bad output position that we see just now. So the idea is to send this bad output to some good input position. Because once you send it to the good input position, it will not have another single active bit transition in the next round. And you will start having propagation at delta zero, uh, delta O. And similarly, from the backward direction, uh, delta I will also have at least branching number two. Uh, sorry, uh, has Hemming weight, num Hemming weight two. So using this bogey structure, we can have at least seven active X boxes in five rounds. And so how do we design this bogey permutation? So we simply send the bits, the bad output to the good input. So for the example just now, we can simply use a identity permutation. That is sending bit one to bit one, bit two to bit two, bit zero to bit zero, and bit three to bit three. And a necessary and sufficient condition for this is that the size of the bad output must not be more than the size of the good input. So from here we can immediately derive that the sum of the good input and the good output must be at least four. So we denote this as the score of an S-box. So we are, to construct this bogey permutation, we will need the S-box to have score four and above. And what's good about this bogey permutation is that this can also be extended to the linear, linear case. So we can also look at the one-to-one -one bit linear approximation table and use a similar strategy to design the bit permutation. So for our give bit permutation, it will look something like this. So all the bit zero goes to bit zero, bit one goes to bit one, and so on and so forth. And so our task now is to select an S box with score four and has an identity bogey bit permutation. So for the S box, so our design criteria is as follow. The first one is definitely choosing a S box lighter than the present S box. And we want to have at least score four for both the differential and linear case. And there exists a common bogey identity permutation for both of them. So with one permutation, it can defend against differential and linear at the same time. And for transition that is not optimal, means transition that is higher than two to the minus two, we restrict it to have a total hemming weight of at least four, which means that if an attacker wants to use a transition that has higher probability, then he must pay more in the previous round and the next round by having at least four active Xboxes. So the Xbox that we choose has 16 GE, which is lighter than the present Xbox. Although it has a maximum differential probability of two to minus 1.4, there's only two such transition. And as mentioned just now, the sum of the Hemingway for the input and output differences is four. And the maximum approximation linear bias is two to the minus two. And we have algebraic degree three and no fixed point. So now I'll talk about the performance. So I'll just focus on the differential and linear cryptanalysis. So for GIF, uh, you can see that after several rounds, out the we achieve the same differential bound as present, which is have a, having an average of two active S-boxes per round. And in the addition to that, we can achieve the same bound for the linear case. So for even for linear, we can achieve 
18 Xboxes in 9 rounds. Whereas for present, there's only 9 active Xboxes for 9 rounds. So our crypto analysis mainly focus on the 9 round case. So if you look at this table, for 9 rounds differential, GIF has a differential probability of 2 to the, min two to the 40. Uh, yeah, should be negative. So 2 to the negative 44.415, and linear is also quite low. So we estimate to, that we need 14 rounds to prevent any meaningful differential or cryptanalysis attack. So we believe that 28 rounds of GIF is sufficient. And for present, because the linear how effect is stronger, so you will need more rounds for defending against linear cryptanalysis. And for the hardware and software performance, so because we do not have the mixed column, so the hardware cost mainly comes from the S boxes. And since we have a very lightweight S box, basically we can beat all of most of the state of the art uh, lightweight block ciphers. And we have a higher throughput because we have lower number of rounds and lower energy consumption. And for the bit slice implementation, although we are slightly s slower than Simon, but we are faster than Skinny. So uh, it's more efficient in bit slice implementation, partly because for the bit permutation, now we have all the bit I mapping to bit I. So when you look at the bit slice implementation, you don't have to shuffle the bits across different register. You can just do a shuffle within the register itself. So it's more efficient. So in conclusion, we propose a new lightweight block cipher with two block size version, GIF64 and GIF128. So it's an improvement over present. We have we removed the Xbox constraint of branching number three. So because of that, we can use lighter S boxes than present. And we prevent the linear crypto analysis weakness in present and we improve the performance. And we also extend this construction to 128 bit size. Yeah. And in general, it has strong, is strong against classical differential and linear crypto analysis and also have better performance than existing lightweight block ciphers. So that's all for the presentation. Thank you. Questions? Again, no questions. <laughs> um, do you plan to add a tweak? Uh, because nowadays, uh, tweakable block ciphers is the new thing. Yeah, for the moment, we do not have plans for tweakable block ciphers. This is mainly designed for a very aggressive, small size design. Yeah. yeah, but if you have a mode, you need to do stuff around it. Huh? Yeah, maybe we will look into that in the future. Yeah. OK. No more questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, so now we get something uh, completely different. Um, it's about uh, password authenticated key exchange. So making these uh, kind of protocols suitable for resource constrained industrial control devices. Uh, it's a paper by Björn Hase and Benoit Labric, and uh, the talk will be given by Björn. So thank you for the kind introduction. Today in my talk, I'd like to take you with me to the world of process automation. So when we at Anderson Hauser are talking about process automation, we are speaking of chemical plants, oil and gas installation, wastewater plants, uh, production facilities like uh, also for medicament production or also, also for food. So we are, in, in this, uh, we are working in this area. Since I expect that you don't have background in process automation, I'd like to give you a bigger picture on where, uh, uh, how such an installation looks like. So it's constructed in a layered system you are having on the topmost level the manufacturing execution system provided by company leaks like SAP. 
This interfaces to the distributed control system provided by companies like Siemens, Yokogawa, and Emerson. And what we are concerned with at Anderson Tauser mostly are the so-called field devices. Field devices are the lower most components in an industrial plant, which uh, so th the devices that are closest to the process. So we have to deal with harsh process environmental conditions. We have tight resource constraints. We have low computational power. And often, explosion protection is mandatory in our setting. So when looking at the interface between the DCS level and the field devices, there are a number of different uh, standards that apply. For example, also field digital field bus interfaces. But still, in 2017, the most important interface between the distributed control system and the field level is analog process value encoding. So you encode a process value in, the, in a current between 4 and 20 milliamps, milli, milliamps, and the supply voltage amounts to 12 volts typically, 12 to 14, 24 volts. So to stress it, in case that you didn't get that, we don't have digital data exchange between the DCS and the field device in most settings. So also, we in the process environment are having advances and our field devices are becoming more and more complex to operate. Still, the local human-machine interface is restricted by the rough environmental conditions, temperature ranges or waterproof uh, uh, aspects. So, typically, you end up with two lines of text or three buttons, not much more. So, there's a big description discrepancy with what you are used to from the consumer market or office environment. So it, it's obvious to have the idea, what about reusing consumer technologies such as Bluetooth 4.0? The question, what, what, what's the reason for this talk is, the question, is security adequate? When reusing consumer protocols for an, an industrial use case, you have to have in mind that they were not originally designed for the threats and the uh, use cases that are present in our setting. So for example, Bluetooth 4.0 Low Energy uses a weak challenge response protocol for the authentication of the devices. Clearly not adequate for industrial use. That's nothing uh, spe special, it's even stated in the original specification of the Bluetooth standard. So, in my opinion, a careful threat analysis is advisable before considering reuse of consumer or office IT technology in our setting. When starting the project of pre preparing a wireless human machine interface, we have started with a threat analysis and in order to derive the key security requirements that we should, meet, should be meeting. And we came to the conclusion that all wireless or IP-based networks should be considered vulnerable and under control, full control of the attacker. We also assume that the human-machine interface might easily be uh, manipulated or compromised or stolen. So we have the, imposed the constraints that we do not want to store any keys, allowing for changes in the param parameters of the field device. Uh, uh, so no keys in the smartphone or tablet. So the main security target in process installations is the plant integrity and availability. So confidentiality normally is, of le is a lesser issue. But since we aim at changing the access credentials via a um, vulnerable channel, we also need forward security and uh, confidentiality for the wireless interface. It is important to have in mind that we're having additional application restrictions and constraints. For example, for important markets such as pharma and life science, regulations impose us to have individual operator uh, authentication. And this today is typically, typically done by use of passwords. Also, since we don't provide the entire system, we have to deal with lots of different types of tablets or, PC, or industry PCs as interface to our field devices. Uh, 
So some, but not all, relevant handhelds might have QR code cameras, identification card readers, or USB connectors. The only interface that you could rely on in our solution is the keyboard. An additional important aspect where we are working on is that in many industry installations today, no certificate authority is available, precluding lots of protocols based on certificates. We assume that our system should be secure even if the customer has not installed a CA authority in his plant. So we came to the conclusion that if we cannot avoid use of passwords for practical reasons, we should really protect our customers' uh, installation by adequate technology. And the only thing that we found that we could do is password authenticated key exchange. So when trying to implement that in practice, you're faced with a challenge triangle. On the one side, you have the security requirements. On the other side, you have to deal with the resource constraints, mainly power and memory. And thirdly, since we are providing solutions to be shipped worldwide, we have to deal with security patterns around. So one main constraint for the resources is the power budget. So we have uh, typically the most difficult issue when designing a field device is dealing with limited uh, available energy. So it stems from the interfaces that we are used that we have to deal with, but it also stems from uh, explosion protection requirements. In order to prevent ignition by hot surfaces, the easiest way and the cheapest way to do for, for t tiny devices is to limit the peak supplied electrical power. So our typical field devices have to work, have to be functional with an available power in the range of 30 milliwatts. For reference, this is typically what you need for powering one single LED. You also have to prevent ignition by sparks, which could be triggered by the energy stored in a capacitor. So the, our standards such as uh, 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 intrinsic safety, according to IEC 679 uh, trade 11, enforce that we cannot integrate large capacitors in our devices. So making things worse, uh, when looking at the system level, for the add-on feature of the wireless human machine interface, uh, the combined wireless solution and the security will be given only a small fraction of the available power in the entire device. So say 1.5 milliwatts and half a millijoule of energy to give, give an idea. So let's sum up um, the, the most important requirements. We want an augmented PEG scheme. We have to avoid patterns. We have to avoid user perceivable login delay. We have almost no power. Strict memory requirements. And the contribution of this, our work is the results of implementation research in taken and in, started in 2015 and regarding which primitives, protocol choices, implementation techniques might work in our highly constrained setting. <clears throat> Since it dates back to 2015, we didn't consider more recent designs such as uh, Michael Kummer or 4Q at that time. So how did we proceed? We started with uh, testing uh, secure remote password and we ended up with login delays in the range of two minutes. We then learned that we had to switch back to switch to something new when we started to use the brain pool curves because German, being German, we tried first brain pool and NIST standards. And we first observed that there are a lot of pattern pitfalls around, specifically regarding uh, PEG protocols. For example, there has been a patent on speak uh, that has expired this year in, uh, in this thing. So still, our estimates showed that the login delays were, uh, should be rather long for, uh, today, for nowadays security level. So then we switched over and tried to, find, to, find, tried to be faster and try to find a solution on Edwards and Montgomery curves since they seem to be much faster than the other ones. We used uh, an open source implementation by Michael, uh, Michael Schwabe and Michael, uh, Peter Schwabe and Michael Hutter as starting point and ported it to the M0. 
we had looked for scanned the, uh, the protocol uh, 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 proposals and came to the conclusion that password authenticated connection establishment is suitable in our setting. We assessed the speed of the asymmetric crypto re required by the protocol and found that it's implemented in NZC, it's still way too slow. So we um, had it over. We didn't fi find a, a standardized curve on the lowest security level and developed curve 1911.9. It was only in, in joint work in 2015, together with skilled people here, uh, that we succeeded in getting significant speed up for X25519 protocols. Uh, so that we were able to switch back for, to curve, curve 15, 25519, so switch back to the 128-bit security level using Parcher with our remote human machine in solution. So we had rolled out uh, the application and the first sensors in 2006, uh, w um, again with 128-bit security level. What I'm talking about here today is only a small a uh, fraction of the entire solution. Basically, I'm talking about a, a balanced PAIC scheme, which we use as a building block in our augmented PAIC solution. So, what about password authenticated connection establishment, or PARCHE, as it was co coined by Bender, Kugler, and, and Fischlin? So, basically, it's a protocol developed for travel documents. Parcher is not just a protocol, but rather a tailorable protocol family. One important design target was to open paths for pattern circumvention. The Parcher protocol family members mainly consist of four main steps. The first key idea is that we want to run a Diffie-Hellman protocol with an ephemeral generator of the group, and we want to conceal the generator from an attacker. The second key idea is, if we encrypt a random number as under a password-derived key, it still looks like random for the attacker. And the most important task for Parcher is how to convert a random secret S to a generator of the group. The original Parcher paper discusses four alternative choices. For the German ID card, uh, they had chosen an implementation on uh, uh, brain pool curves based on uh, short wire stress form. And in this setting, they, they uh, observed that it's necessary to use a pattern circumvention, and they chose an inefficient gen uh, algorithm which they call generic mapping. The speed penalty factor of this in comparison to the most efficient integrated mapping is in the range of uh, a penalty factor of three. So what's our choice for our uh, PAIC solution in the, in the Anderson Salvador service app? So we first uh, use Curve 25519 uh, and use the X-coordinate only Diffie-Hellman protocol. Luckily, we are having a mapping function available which is not covered by patterns, which is alligator 2. It's very efficiently calculatable so that the entire Parcher protocol run essentially has the main computational complexity as ephemeral Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So the password authentication comes at no additional cost. We make use of the twist security feature of Curve 25519, which allow for a very simple method for the mandatory point verification. It's essentially the same thing that you have seen yesterday in the RAMP session uh, regarding the uh, key retrieval uh, of the, uh, uh, for, for saving uh, the, the princess. Uh, the idea is we, in, we could rule out the weak points by checking that the intermediate, that, that the uh, point, uh, the result of the X25519 protocol is not the, uh, the neutral element. So we have implemented that, used the tricks uh, of Peter and, uh, and uh, of our, our joint work, work together, and we end up with quite decent run times on, the, uh, on our wireless transceiver unit. So our, our system uses no secret dependent branches, and we implement the conditional swaps 
uh, by logic. So the runtime amounts to roughly a half a second, which is perfect from a usability point of view, almost not perceivable by the user. The difficulty in our setting is that the CPU cannot be clocked down. So we have to, uh, uh, we, uh, have to take into account that the synchronous execution of the protocol takes roughly four millijoule. You recall the energy buffer or the capacitor size that is permissible in our setting, so we are no longer explosion protected with this solution. So we went further and um, defined an asynchronous interface, asynchronous operation mode of the protocol, which we call asynchronous crypto engine, meaning roughly th three quarters of the implementation effort of the stuff. So we stop chop the calculation into chunks and go to sleep in the intermediate steps if necessary. So here you see the different intermediate steps, the biggest um, transients and the biggest uh, energy amount that is available and needs to be available synchronously is it's roughly 150 microjoule due to the exponentation operation that we use for alligator and the, uh, and the, in and the inversions. My comeback told me that probably we could a bit do a bit better with one inversion only, uh, one exponentiation only for the alligator. Um, but at the moment, so we are at a, when considering a power budget of 1.5 milliwatts for wireless activity and co uh, compu uh, computation of the shared secret, we end up with a uh, calculation time in the range of four seconds. So the operator, operator sees a delay during the login in the range of four seconds. Clearly perceivable, but uh, there's not much room for losing efficiency, obviously. So for our proposal for targets which are even smaller um, is uh, curve 1911.9. Basically, it's the little brother of Curve 2519 using a, a prime uh, two to the, uh, so the prime, you could read it. <laughs> and the idea is basically the same. I've used the same uh, curve derivation process as, uh, as chosen for Curve 2519. There's one single difference. I have imposed the requirement that uh, the, const the curve parameter a plus two shall be a square. The advantage of doing so is that this choice allows for the um, most efficient hiesel wong carter dawson addition formulas on the uh, isomorphic Edwards curve. So these are the, is the result of the de curve derivation process. Today, I th my estimate is that it will be uh, as about as fast as um, um, uh, for Q on the M0 targets. Um, <clears throat> so I expect uh, that today there might be, if you have more memory available that would be used for 4Q, 4Q might be a suitable choice as well for uh, if you have not less energy available. So when comparing um, Curve 1911.9 with Curve 2519, we have a speed R advantage regarding multiplication and squaring in the range of uh, 1.5. Uh, we have less of improvement, of course, for addition and for operations that might be suitable for uh, preventing template attacks. And uh, regarding the uh, X-coordinate only uh, Diffie-Hellman protocol, we are a factor of 1.92 faster than Curve 2519. So let me summarize my talk. In our work in, at Anderson Tarsa, we have explored the design space of PAIC protocols for the constraint setting of a remote human-machine interface for field devices. And within the jungle of patterns, we came the, to the conclusion that the Parcher protocol is a well-suited choice, mainly was because, also because Speak used to be patented at that time. We have asynchronized Parcher using Curve 25519 and Alligator 2 as mapping substep, and we succeeded in re reaching acceptable operator login delays in the range of four seconds. We have ev evaluated also various other choices. For example, we have uh, uh, established a solution for the 96-bit security level, being roughly a factor of two faster. And we also have evaluated 
the speed penalty that we get uh, when we use the pattern circumvention required for wire stress curves. For example, on P256, I expect that we, we will be having a factor of two alone of speed delay only for the uh, pattern circumvention in addition to the uh, lower speed that you have for Diffie-Hellman on this curve. So we end up with times that might no longer be acceptable for the operator. And we have an expect an additional speed penalty for random prime curves such as brain pool. So the bottom line is efficiency matters. If there were not so efficient protocols, implementations, uh, as developed in research by you, we would certainly have driven back to weak challenge response protocols. So let me thank you for your attention. Questions? Okay, thanks a lot for your talk. Actually, it was pretty interesting to see that uh, one point millivolts can cause an explosion. Uh, it's uh, indeed. Uh, so I was thinking, I mean, you're still staying with software solutions um, uh, and trying to be, you're staying with software solutions and, and trying to be energy efficient or power uh, efficient. Have you considered um, uh, hardware? Uh, accelerate so basically it? our problem is that we typically don't have the volumes uh, that are required for ASIC solutions. For example, imagine that you're having a, a product line running only for with 100,000 sensors a year. It's, it's way too expensive to, uh, 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 to prepare an, uh, an ASIC for this purpose. Also, we have to deal with lots of different requirements. For example, I'm having, a sh I'm having several sensors here for, for show that we have in series production. Uh, we have to deal with, um, for example, for liquid analysis, sterilization is an important issue, so we have to use components running at 125 degrees Celsius. So we have to choose everywhere for e each application a different subset uh, uh, of components that are suitable for this application. And for each market, for example, if you're having an installation on a gas pipe in Siberia, you have to deal with minus uh, 40 or minus 50 degrees. So, and we always have to pick uh, very particular components that makes it difficult to, uh, to design an ASIC for these uh, low volumes uh, in the, in the sub-solution. -sub so we stick at the moment to, uh, for these explosion protected devices, we stick to software-based solution, but clearly we are integrating in the uh, solutions which have more energy, may, maybe an Ethernet-based sensor. In our, in, uh, we are preparing solutions, including smart card EC ICs, in order to have more flexibility and also better, better hardware uh, security of the credentials. Thanks. Um, you mentioned using a mobile phone as user interface. Now, mobile phones use a lot more power and energy than mm -hmm. uh, your budget for explosion security uh, uh, allows. Is that not a problem for explosion uh, protection as well? Or so that specifically means that, you, for example, you have to use a smartphone or a tablet, which is, has also an explosion protection approval, which uh, may, for example, uh, but it's not as close to the process. This is one of the major advantages of using wireless technology because we have a zone characterization. The sensors tip, tip often are placed in zone zero where you have explosive atmosphere every, all the time and you have very strict requirements. In zone one, for example, which might be five meters away, you could have much more relaxed requirements. And for, uh, for this reason, it's, uh, it's a uh, uh, very suitable choice to, to have an option to use an industry tablet certified for zone one, uh, and you simply step five meters away and you have, uh, you have your service interface. You don't have to, uh, to connect wires with an equipment uh, certified for zone zero. Question? Thank you for your talk. So you, you mentioned plant availability and uh, integrity as one of the, the major security objectives in your design. And so I was wondering if you think about uh, denial of service attacks, um, do you consider these to be relevant to HMI and how would, the, how would denial of service relate to what you just described? So in our security spec, we, we, uh, 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 we uh, clearly stated that 
for the wireless solution. Anyway, we are not able to, uh, to be uh, safe with respect to denial of service, since the easiest way to do it for an attacker is just jamming the channel. So for the Bluetooth solution, we are not aiming at, at the, uh, DOS safety, security. On the other hand, when considering, for example, the, protocol, the same protocol as Substep or Element on an IP-based system, we are uh, planning to use a, um, a DOS protection layer on top, huh? say me to wrap our protocol into an additional uh, DOS layer, uh, in order, because in this setting, uh, DOS protection might be relevant. But on, in the, bo the, the bottom line is the, there is a difference between the availability requirements for the service interface and the availability requirements for the plant itself. So the interface to the distributed control system is way more critical than the interface uh, for service access. No more questions? I was wondering, you speak about uh, software solutions, but, um, and it's too expensive to make an ASIC, but what about FPGAs? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, just imagine an FPGA tr if you take these RAM-based systems. Yeah. Huh? Typically, you have a big RAM uh, section, and uh, look at the inrush current that it takes when the, uh, 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 the flip-flops didn't decide in the beginning where, uh, where they are placed. That, uh, the, the power budget clearly explodes. Ah, yeah. The only thing that you could use is uh, there are these Actel, or uh, I don't know if it's called, uh, it's a new name now, mm -hmm. flash-based uh, FPGA, FPGA systems, which we also use in some application, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, in, in this context, we didn't consider it also because in the, in the uh, census uh, having these wireless interfaces, we don't have uh, much space. We have to squeeze also the space uh, a bit, and that's uh, also a cost question because these flash-based systems are quite expensive. Yeah, okay, of course, yeah. Okay, let's uh, thank Bjorn again and all the rest of the speakers of the <laughs>